Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Our Children Can't Wait webinar series. My name is Caitlin McAloon, and I'm the Digital Communications Coordinator at CTS. Today, speakers will be discussing school finance, students experiencing homelessness, and racial justice in education policy. This webinar is recording, and we will be sharing materials later on. If anyone has any questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A box. At this time, I'd like to introduce our executive director and the author and editor of Our Children Can't Wait, Dr. Joseph Bishop. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Kaylin. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Joe Bishop, again, Executive Director for the Center for the Transformation of Schools, and CTS is hosting today's conversation and the lead editor for this book, Our Children Can't Wait, The Urgency of Reinventing Education Policy in America from Teachers College Press. Um, and if you're, if you're keeping track, this is the third of five webinars on the book. Um, and But today, uh, I'm really honored to have friends and guests with us, Dr. Oscar Jimenez Castellanos, uh, P12 Research Director for the Education Trust, and Dr. Daniel Danielle Ferry, the Research Director for Ed Law Center. And uh, both Oscar and Danielle are going to be uh, touching upon key points of Chapter 12 from our children. Can't, can't wait on how ed funding models need to fundamentally change in our country in pursuit of a justice agenda. Um, after Oscar and Danielle are going to speak, you're going to hear from Dr. Matt Morton. And Matt has a new position. He's, he's the executive director of the Constellation Lab at the Constellation Fund. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. We're also going to hear from an old friend of ours, Dr. Earl Edwards, now assistant professor from the Lynch School of Education and Human Development at Boston College. And Earl uh, is an alum of our program at UCLA in urban studies and uh, worked with our center as a scholar over many years. So Earl, good to see you again. And Matt and Earl are gonna be talking about a topic that's near and dear to their heart, um, the national crisis for students experiencing homelessness that's impacting over 1 million school age students. We're gonna talk about not only how we can support young people, but also prevent young people from being housing insecure. Uh, let's go to the, and actually, and I'll say in the last part, um, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of chapter 16 of the book, which is all about kind of the how, how do we reach the policies we need? So we're going in, in a different order. Um, but again, you hear from you here on chapter 12, uh, 15 and 16 today. So let's jump in. Okay, so we are hosting as a team here, uh, monthly webinars on the topic. We're going through all 16 chapters, as I mentioned. I also want to point out the fact that if you want to get in a little bit more to the book and to the topics today, there's a podcast. Um, Danielle, Oscar, Earl, Matt, or I interview all of them. And every Wednesday, we have a new podcast episode. So if you look up Our Children Can't Wait on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can follow the podcast. We actually just had a new one come out today on um, segregation with Erica Frankenberg and Jen Askew. It's, it's a really good listen. Um, so again, every Wednesday, if you follow, you will get an episode and it'll pop up in your phone just automatically. So I encourage you to do that. If you have your phone out now, let's go to the next slide, please. So let's actually, um, so you can see we've, we've covered a lot starting in February, uh, racism in schools, public health and air quality last month. Can't believe it's already almost the end of April now, but in March integration, housing and community safety, I encourage you to go to our website. You can also go to ourchildrencan'twait.com. You can get bios for all the speakers today um, and get a lot of information, some pretty incredible people who we've, who we've teamed up, um, who we brought together for this book and this project. Next slide, please. So the main ideas behind Our Children Can't Wait, I'm going to summarize the book basically in three main points just to give you context if you're new here. You should know that we touch on all these themes. So that, that's why this visual is up for you. But here's the bottom line. We need a new conception of ed policy in our country. Uh, the ecosystem outside of schools is central to ed policy, like housing, the environment, health, and community safety. And we have to acknowledge that in-school and out-of-school factors must be prioritized simultaneously in policy. And typically, historically, they have not. 
Uh, number two, racism is the main driver behind policies that have codified an unequal playing field for students and families of color for many generations in our country. Number three, we are all policymakers. That's something I'm going to talk about here briefly, but we need new ways of doing policy to put young people, families, and community members in the driver's seat of their own destiny, right? Policy cannot be an exclusive club anymore. Um, it does not work. Um, so building upon that last point, we are all policymakers. Let's go to the next slide, please. Bringing the vision together, how do we reach the policies we need? So this is the final chapter. We're doing it now today because I think it'll tie to the funding and homelessness piece uh, pretty directly. Next slide, please. Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, so we think of policy. We're trying to move beyond this paradigm. <laughs> Looking at a state house, state legislature, that's Sacramento, California's capital. We're trying to move beyond this idea of policy. This is the place and space where policy takes shape to this. Next slide, please. This is a lot easier and straightforward. I'm kidding. So in chapter 16, we talk about, I talk about a justice and youth-centered policy process. Again, a process, not an outcome, a process. It's not just a piece of paper like the one I'm holding in my hand. When we think about policy, sometimes we think about, okay, we're done. We adopted this policy. Let's move on to the next issue, right? So I'm going to very quickly run through this framework as a new way of thinking about policy. Next slide, please, Caitlin. Thank you so much. One, we have to listen. Listen to students, families, and educators first. And we actually have to do less talking. Listen first, talk less. We need to focus, we need focus groups, interviews, and spaces to listen about what we need. We often jump into, I would argue, the plan adopt space without actually listening or assessing the landscape first. So listen, listen is, is a profound start to this process. Next step, please, or next slide, please. Number two, assess. We need to take inventory of existing policies, research, and efforts that are already focused on a topic or issue. Sometimes we think we have this amazing idea that nobody else has had, um, or sometimes we ignore when folks say that's actually a, a really harmful policy or we don't need that. We need less policies. Um, so we need to assess the landscape again and look, look what's out there first before we jump in. Next slide, please. Plan. So we need to plan and prioritize and think about where we want to focus our efforts as potential solutions or policy solutions. Um, I think the key word here is prioritize. I was just in a state capitol a few weeks ago, and folks were saying that every member had a whole handful of bills. Nobody was talking to each other. They all had this big idea, um, but in some instances hadn't talked to their constituents or classroom teachers, but everybody had an education bill. Um, and staff were trying to figure out how could what what could they do next because everybody had kind of their pet project that they really wanted to push through. But we have to prioritize together, not individually. Next slide, please. Once we know we want to do uh, what we want to do, we have to adopt policies. But here's the key. Here's the kicker: we can't just adopt policies in isolation. We have to go to the folks who actually came up with the ideas and who said we need this. Oscar said this, Danielle said this, I'm going to go back to Oscar and Danielle and ask them, is this really what you mean? Let's adopt this, implement this policy together, right? So going back to the folks who have actually, who, who've, who've pushed us to end up in this direction. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, there's a major issue, and I think... Uh, our, our colleagues here are going to talk about this, about the implementation, the intent versus the impact gap, right? Is the intent, as we think about evaluating, is the intent of our work reaching the impact we had in, in re reaching the, the, um, the folks that we say we want to reach, um, that the policies we have in mind, are they really having the meaningful impact we hope? We have to think about the design of the policy, the implementation of it, and evaluating the policy itself in a larger landscape. But we rarely will actually take the time to evaluate um, at all levels to see what's actually happening. Last step, last but not least, we have to refine and improve. Our tendency in general in the policy world is to throw the baby out with the bathwater or to just create a new funding stream, right? Uh, this process though, as we move forward, has to be cyclical. It cannot be linear. I, produce, I shared this in a very linear fashion. Um, but we have to figure out 
also and recognize that you know different pieces might come up at different moments. We might be listening and assessing and adopting and evaluating all at the same time, right? So it's it's a very fluid process that we have to accept. But again, the, the, the idea of policy is a process that we all are understanding and making sense of is critical as we move forward. So I just wanted to share a preview of chapter 16, but now I'm gonna shift, we're gonna make a major shift here uh, to Dr. Oscar Jimenez Castellanos and Daniel Ferry. And that's actually an example of a case study from our uh, center, which I think actually captures uh, uh, Dr. Miguel Casar is an incoming professor at the University of Alabama is gonna, he's a lead author of this report, but I think this captures this essence of a different policy paradigm and a different process. So if you wanna look at it, I think it's a good example of some of these themes I just highlighted right here. Let's go to Oscar and Danielle though with the next slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Joe, um, and, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Oscar Jimenez Castellanos, my colleague, Daniel Fari, and also we have another co-author that's not with us, um, David Quinn, that I just want to acknowledge the chapters moving beyond injustice and distributive justice towards the transformative justice in school finance. So I only have a couple of slides um, and then I'll hand it over to, to my colleague, Danielle. Um, uh, you know, the United States um, pretends to operate in a colorblind, non-racialized meritocracy as uh, Antonia Darder reminded us many years ago and others. Um, yet our school finance system cannot be separated from a systemic racist roots. Um, uh, as explained in this book and in this chapter, the funding of public schools was designed as a tool for injustice to marginalize black, indigenous, and people of color and privilege wealthy white communities. So that is sort of the thesis that we propose. And the original um, um, uh, pillars, if you will, of this injustice um, uh, is one, funding public schools using local property taxes. Um, the United, according to Slavin, the United States is the only um, country that uses um, local property wealth as a way to fund elementary and secondary education. Um, this notion here in the US started in 1647, um, uh, where public schools to be funded through local property tax as land was considered to be a valid measure of wealth. Um, you know, if you think about 1647, um, not many people owned land. Um, uh, uh, it was very uh, exclusive to, to white males. So uh, indigenous folks did not believe in um, land owning um, and, and blacks at that time um, were not allowed for the most part to, to own land. Um, so again, it was um, a, a construct that was very, from its inception, designed to sort of privilege uh, those that actually had land. Um, and, and thus creating this atmosphere that education belonged to them because they funded it through this local property tax. Um, uh, education is not a constitutional right, is another pillar um, of injustice. Uh, the United States Constitution does not explicitly mention education or guarantee any type of an education. Um, 195 out of 203 countries include education in their constitution, including all the countries outperforming the United States on international education performance matrix. And that sort of by definition creates sort of um, inequality and equity across um, the, the states um, by having this 50 state system. Um, uh, segregation and racialized funding equity is another pillar of school finance, a tool for racial injustice. Um, we have Plessy versus Ferguson, US Supreme Court in 18, uh, 1896 that legalized separate but equal. Then we had um, Jim Crow that enacted voter suppression, prohibiting interracial marriage, segregated public accommodations, uh, et cetera. Um, and again, if you marry sort of the notion of property wealth 
with segregation and racialized funding um, inequity, um, it, it, it sort of compounds the, the impact. And also racialized redlining um, that was sanctioned um, by our government um, uh, as Rothstein uh, in, his, in his book um, a few years back um, re-reminded us. Um, and, uh, you know, um, redlining, um, which sort of literally draws a red line on a map around the neighborhood that would not, that folks would not invest in and thus drive down the property wealth. And most of the black inner city neighborhoods um, uh, were most likely to be redlined. Um, and then that was married with the modern school district boundaries that were institutionalized in the mid 1900s. Um, um, that sort of sort of re um, um, institutionalized school um, segregation by these district boundaries that were racialized, uh, racially motivated. Um, and very quickly, uh, I'll move down to the civil rights movement and beginning of the school finance litigation era. So since education is a state issue, all of these court cases, starting with the Serrano case in 1971, and then the obviously the we're in the 50th anniversary of the Rodriguez case um, um, that sort of uh, reaffirmed that education is not a U.S. constitutional right. Um, um, but uh, there was a notion that we're questioning the state constitution's ability to fund education um, or fairness uh, in funding education. And then the, um, after that, you know, there was some modification. So we call that the era of remedial distributive justice. So post Serrano, post Rodriguez, you know, there was an attempt to try to equalize both from a horizontal and a vertical equity notion of uh, the treatment of unequals. Um, yet, uh, although this marks a meaningful significant shift uh, in the goals of school finance policy, we argued that the excessive, excessive focus on distributive justice, meaning just distributing more um, money um, uh, in itself is, is insufficient to transform our school finance system. Um, and because it does not attend to the root causes of injustice, but rather attempts to remediate through the institution of schooling and unequal distribution of benefits and burdens found in society more generally. We term this uh, remedial distributive um, justice. So if we could go to the next slide. And lastly, what we propose is a transformative justice uh, paradigm that includes structural justice, anti-based distributive justice and dignitary justice uh, and procedural justice. And I'll go very quickly because I'm, I'm probably over time already, um, but um, structural justice means that, that we need to fundamentally change the way that we fund public schooling um, and starting with, you know, trying to erode those original pillars that um, created the injustice um, to begin with. Um, we need to, um, so we argue that money is necessary, but insufficient, right? And, and, and that distributive notion of, of, of justice needs to be an asset-based one, meaning instead of looking at students um, um, in poverty or uh, language minority students, et cetera, as um, deficient, we need to really build on their aspirations, goals, and strengths as a, as a student, as individuals, and as a community. Dignitary justice is meaning that we need to dignify and treat everyone um, as equal and, and value those perspectives. Um, and the procedural justice goes to this notion that Joe brought up, um, which is sort of the process. It's not just, um, right now, school finance is arguably the most exclusive club in policy, meaning the fewest people that are engaged, yet it impacts every single child, family, and community in very significant ways, but very few actually have a voice um, to make that change. So I'll stop there and, and hand it over to my colleague, Danielle. Thank you, Oscar. So um, I think my job here is to talk about how we can actually implement some of these theoretical concepts that Oscar described into real world education policies. So I'm really gonna um, discuss a couple of the case studies that we include in our chapter as examples of where current efforts can incorporate a more transformative model of school finance. 
So ideally, we need to develop these models um, that bridge local, state, and federal policy and speak to each other in a systemic way. Um, we're clearly not there yet, but these case studies do offer some examples of the hard work that's needed to enact the transformational school finance reform. So I'm going to start with New Mexico as an example of a statewide campaign that embraced the ideas, ideals for a truly equitable education for all students. So when the state court found that New Mexico's school funding system was uncon unconstitutional, the judge ordered that the state had to comprehensively overhaul its program services and funding in order to address the inadequacies that were highlighted in the trial. And as is in the case of most successful school finance litigation, there was a strong advocacy community that was ready to take up this challenge. Um, Transform Education New Mexico was a coalition of education, tribal, and community leaders, and they developed a platform to fix the education system. And the platform was developed by students, parents, educators, community, and tribal leaders using the rich body of evidence and research that was documented throughout the trial. So you can see from the diagram that the platform is centered on student equity and it embraces a multicultural and multilingual foundation using an asset-based framework. So the group was really intentional about using an anti-racist approach to equity, one that celebrated the state's multicultural heritage and created a learning environment that celebrated the language and cultural diversity through a curriculum that was responsive to students and also through teacher training to, um, to make sure everyone was prepared. Um, next slide, please. So a complementary platform was also developed by the Tribal Education Alliance, which specifically focused on the needs of Native students. So their platform clearly wrestles with the historical, historically unequal power dynamics that were embedded within the education system and makes the case for procedural and dignitary justice to undo the decades of harm caused by the system. So this requires elevating the voices of communities that have been historically acted upon and instead giving them equal power to make decisions to uplift their own communities. And so while these groups have shown the kind of transformation that is possible and they have had you know, definitely some policy wins, the challenge of moving these proposals into actual policy is also very clear. But as is the case with most court ordered school finance reform, the road from favorable court rulings to actual implementation of a remedy is long and winding, but um, I'm hopeful that, the, that New Mexico will actually get there. Um, next slide. So the second example I have for you is about how a local school district was able to leverage the changes that came from California school finance reform. So this reform gave California districts an unprecedented amount of flexibility in how they could spend their money. Um, Sanger Unified is a district of about 12,000 um, predominantly low income, majority Latino students in California's Central Valley. And they use this opportunity to put in place programs and policies to improve student achievement and school culture. And they did this by creating a greater culture of collaboration between administrators and teachers and by breaking down the traditional hierarchical power dynamics. They also invoked elements of procedural justice and the creation of a multi-tiered system of support for social and emotional development by centering this, the experiences and viewpoints of the most affected populations of students. And they also created relationships with the broader community by hosting family literacy nights and other educational pro programming and creating a community of caring task force that involved organizations across the city. So just to be clear, these changes did not happen overnight and they were the result of nearly a decade of hard work, but they did result in significant improvements in student achievement and Sanger was actually named one of um, Learning Policy Institute's positive outliers. The ability of a district to make a, such a drastic transformation is predicated on having the resources necessary to implement these, this change and for the districts that are reliant on a state funding system that is responsive to their needs. So in this sense, um, the example of Sanger shows how a local district can leverage opportunity from state policy changes to really impact student experiences. Um, clearly not all districts in California have been as successful, but at least the results here show what's possible. So the examples we share today may be more reflective of you know, the sort of baby steps that are initially needed to usher in more transformational school policy in the future. But I do think they demonstrate that if given the opportunity, schools and communities possess much of the knowledge 
of what is needed to radically transform our schools. We just need the political will to make the investments to make those changes possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferry. And um, I just wanna thank you to you and Dr. Jimenez Castellanos for pushing us to think much more broadly about how funding could work, how the policies could work, and to also show examples, applications in, in the land of enchantment and Sanger Unified, the Central Valley, um, to see what's possible. And to your point, these are baby steps, but they're pretty powerful steps for us to, to learn from. So we're gonna, we're gonna shift um, from funding is kind of driving a lot of things in policy and shift to the really, you could say the, the, the byproduct when we have fundamentally unequal systems, unjust systems, and we talk about the national crisis for students experiencing homelessness. So let's go to Dr. Morton and Dr. Edwards. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Bishop. It's great to be with you all and um, just so appreciate this opportunity and the, the fact that um, this issue is, um, is is so prominent and um, our children can't wait uh, as a central educational equity issue because student homelessness really does drive so much of um, the conversation in the direction um, and students' outcomes and experiences and what that means over their lifetime. And uh, like for many, uh, this is uh, personal to me. I'm a nerd. I like long walks on the beach and evenings of designing unbiased sampling strategies. I'm a researcher by training. And uh, at the same time, uh, I grew up uh, with a lot of childhood trauma, lost my parents at a young age, and um, my household uh, dealt with a great deal of severe mental illness and substance use disorders. But I was lucky uh, because I had a high school English teacher uh, when I was 15 who saw potential in me before I saw it in myself um, and not only supported my educational track, but got me involved in local youth empowerment work um, in my community of Florida. And that changed my trajectory um, and really showed me the power of schools playing a big role and the people in schools playing a big role in young people's trajectories. Uh, and yet um, so many other young people aren't so lucky, uh, like my little sister who has experienced homelessness even until recently um, because she didn't have the same um, fortunate uh, resources and supports early on. And so this uh, can make a difference and it's personal at the same time. It's also very much rooted in the data. And so that's what we'll speak to today um, with my uh, esteemed colleague, Dr. Earl Edwards. So uh, next slide. Uh, speaking to the point of the invisibility of this issue, I think for a long time, uh, our society has treated youth and young adult and student homelessness as a boutique issue, something that's specific and um, to just a small number of young people. And so one of the things that um, I had the opportunity to lead as a, a researcher in my last um, job at Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago was the first ever national prevalence and incident study on youth and young adult homelessness because we lacked even basic statistics on the extent to which this was an issue. And a far cry from what we've seen from point in time counts uh, in the streets or shelter based counts turns out when we uh, we look at a representative sample of youth and young adults and we ask young people directly about their homelessness and housing experiences and not just on a single night or at a, a point in time, but over over the period of an entire year. Uh, the numbers were really alarming. One in 30 adolescent minors ages 13 to 17 reported uh, some form of homelessness within a, a one-year period. With young adults, uh, those rates uh, increased to one in 10, uh, reporting some form of homelessness within a year. About half of those were young people uh, re reporting experiences of couch surfing without a safe and stable place to stay, underscoring the extent to which this issue is so invisible. And this is not an East Coast, West Coast issue. This is not an inner city issue. This is Amer an American challenge. In fact, when we uh, broke the data uh, down by um, the areas in which young people live, uh, the percentage of young people reporting experiences of homelessness in rural counties was statistically equal to the share of young people reporting homelessness um, in urban counties. And so this very much um, is, is a national issue and challenge. Next slide. Yeah, and it's important to also contextualize um, the importance of that, of that survey, right? And so to be able to actually have a survey that shows 
that um, within this sample was 5.2% of students, high school students reported experiencing homelessness in the 2018-2019 survey. That was twice as high as the numbers we received from actual schools. Um, so in this, in this year, we had about 1.3 to 1.5 million students identified as experiencing homelessness across um, the United States. And we know that the number is undercount because um, currently how we are able to identify students uh, within schools is either they um, disclose themselves or um, the homeless liaison happens to find out during their enrollment process. Um, so that gives us a, a 2.3 um, prevalence rate when we look at it from schools. However, um, the survey that Don Morgan was able to lead shows that that's a severe undercount. And we, we know that we have a lot more students that we're not capturing as a result of the uh, inequities and also the um, the challenges that we face when we actually try to identify students experiencing homelessness. So next slide. And so the the biggest policy mechanism that we have within schools to to address students experiencing homelessness is the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act, and that was founded in 1987. Um, now this policy is important because one is the first policy we had uh, as a country that actually looked at homelessness as a public issue. So prior to, um, prior to 1987 and the passing of the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act, homelessness was seen as a, uh, as a private issue. So private charities, uh, private citizens would help individuals um, from a charity perspective experiencing homelessness. However, the government and city governments did not see themselves as having the responsibilities of actually addressing it. So McKinney Mental was a big win for the advocates um, that were organizing around housing justice during that time period. However, it still had the same um, ethos around this charity orientation around um, supporting students and supporting people experiencing homelessness. So one of the policy assumptions that um, McKinney Vento has is that if you coordinate um, nonprofit organizations, charities together, then you can meet the needs of, of individuals experiencing homelessness. And so the federal government took the role of being a coordinator. And so providing some funding, however, really relying on private organizations to actually um, uplift and also support individuals experience of homelessness. So in school districts, we have a homeless liaison whose role is really to um, centralize the different types of supports within a community. However, the policy assumption within this policy is that all communities have adequate access to the community partnerships they actually need to actually push these um, these um, these needs forward for youth experience of homelessness, and so it really goes back to the remedial um, dispute of justice kind of um, framework we talked about with the funding structure. Um, we do not have equal access to actual resources in different places, and those areas that are racialized have even less um, access to actual resources. So some of the barriers that we see in the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act are one lack of federal funding. Um, currently, there's though about sixty dollars. Um, per student that have been identified as experiencing homelessness within schools. Um, also, the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act grants are supplemental grants and they're competitive grants. So most school districts do not receive direct funding to actually address, um, um, address homelessness. Um, also, um, some, um, some folks have to take away some of their Title I funds to actually uh, supplement students experiencing homelessness, which becomes a really big issue if you are a, a, a low income, um, high poverty school district. And so now you're taking away resources from other marginalized students to support another marginalized population. So it actually um, is a disincentive to actually identify students experiencing homelessness because you don't have the money to actually support the students once you identify them. Another big barrier is the misalignment of partner agencies. Um, the Kinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act has a broader definition of homelessness, which includes individuals and kids that are doubling up in CalSurfing. That is not the same definition or the same criteria that, um, that other agent, uh, public agencies use. So, for example, HUD does not use doubling up as an as a indicator of homelessness. Therefore, 70% of the students that are identified in schools for doubling up don't qualify for the actual uh, resources that are actually happening within other public agencies. And the last one, um, and this is a theme, I think, throughout the whole book, is the colorblind implementation of our actual policies. So in 1987, um, when, the, when this policy was actually being established, we had cities in terms of Massachusetts, New York, D.C., um, Los Angeles that had 
60 to 70 percent of their homeless population identify as being black. However, the policy McKinney Vento does not include um, black people experiencing homelessness in the actual framing. Uh, this becomes really important because the issues that were causing black people to fall into homelessness were not actually being addressed within the actual policy. So housing discrimination, um, the, 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 the negative impact of redlining, um, urban renewal, these are all these issues that were causing black people to fall into homelessness were actually being captured in the, um, the actual supports we had to actually support individuals from um, falling into homelessness and also to be able to get out of homelessness faster. And that has a ripple effect. And it's still something that we actually see today. The next slide. And so when we have a colorblind implementation, we can expect to have these disparities that we, uh, that we see um, currently within, within our homeless student population. So black students um, are 2.25 times more likely than white students to experience homelessness and Hispanic students are twice as likely. Also, when we think about LGBTQ um, students, they are 2.1 times, 1.8 times more likely to actually experience homelessness compared to heterosexual students. And it is even worse for our, our students who are uh, identified as transgender. So not having the nuance between the different types of experiences being, um, being shown within our actual policies are leaving a lot of students out from actually receiving the services and also the supports. Um, they need to actually um, get help. Also, when you're thinking about these subpopulations, why they're fall why they're falling into homelessness differs depending on um, these salient identities. Uh, as I mentioned, um, black students and black families are more likely to have housing discrimination, employment discrimination, um, and also gentrification of their communities, be drivers uh, of them falling into homelessness or saving the homelessness, whereas um, students who might identify as LGBTQ may be um, facing more of a push out mechanism of their family and also experiencing more street homelessness as a result of having to separate from the family due to uh, other, other circumstances. So not having that nuance within our policies prevents us from actually serving these students uh, with the actual services they actually need. Next slide. Thanks, Earl. And so what Earl's just highlighted with um, the data uh, and, and some of the framing that I think he's uh, offered really well around the disparities that we see in student homelessness is uh, a, a very stark reality that if we really care about advancing educational equity and educational outcomes, it's central to the educational mission to address and prevent student homelessness as part of that agenda. We simply can't achieve educational outcomes um, that we intend to achieve at a population level without addressing housing and housing instability amongst students and their families as critical to that pathway. And uh, that's for a few reasons. One, because students experiencing homelessness uh, are disproportionately Black and Brown, Indigenous, um, and LGBTQ. Uh, and so that's where we see uh, some of the starkest disparities. Second, we know that student homelessness is uh, a, a, a top predictor of poor educational outcomes and learning and uh, early school leaving. And then third, there is no single population, um, uh, even when you control for income and race and demographics and other factors, uh, that is struggling more in education than those who are experiencing housing instability. So just from a practical, efficient policy perspective, working with and supporting and providing resources, both educational and non-direct educational resources to this population is, is a really smart pathway uh, to getting to better educational outcomes for our schools. So when we think about the how, this is not actually rocket science. There are good models for this and, and how we go about doing it, but the implementation and the will uh, are, are among the great challenges that we face. When we were reviewing um, interventions, we conducted the first systematic review of evaluated programs and interventions for preventing and for addressing youth and young adult homelessness. There were only three interventions that actually were evaluated for preventing youth homelessness before it began. One of those involved schools and it came from Australia. It was called um, first the Geelong Project because it came from the Geelong region of Australia, the, the town, uh, and later called Upstream and has become an international uh, coalition that, um, that the United States has joined with a few other countries, including Canada, Wales, um, and, um, uh, and, and Australia. 
And uh, what this um, really involves is a, a commitment to systems level interventions to preventing youth homelessness. And the Australians saw very good results when they implemented this initially over three years of implementing this systems level model uh, that involves school and community collaboration. They saw uh, a 20% reduction over three years in school dropout among young people in, in the schools that participated. And they saw a 40% reduction of young people entering the, the local homelessness system. So pretty sizable results um, from these early initial evaluations. So what we've uh, worked on doing in, in North America and Canada and the U.S. is starting to, to adapt um, this intervention model. And it's not dissimilar from models that already exist, um, including one, you know, Danielle had referenced before, multi-tiered systems of support uh, that uh, in response to intervention models that schools are already implementing across the country. What this really tries to do is bring that framework into uh, student homelessness and school dropout prevention. Um, and that involves uh, a few key elements. Next slide. In any school system in the country could go about implementing uh, these, uh, these elements to get to both um, student homelessness prevention and stronger educational equity and attainment. First is um, building out a strong school and community uh, collaboration. So that means uh, schools, in this case, middle and high schools, working really closely with local community-based organizations that specialize in connecting young people and their families with the resources that they need uh, to disrupt pathways into homelessness uh, or to help them come out of crisis. Connecting those resources that already exist and making sure that they're available to young people uh, when and how they need them. Second is uh, really key to making this an actual prevention model and not just another crisis response uh, model. What makes this prevention is that uh, these upstream school districts um, that are, are piloting this are implementing a universal screening survey. It takes about 15, 20 minutes uh, for students to complete. They do this at least once a year. They have an opt-out consent process uh, for, for parents um, and uh, and students uh, participate in the survey, and it includes not just questions about whether they're currently experiencing homelessness, though that's important because usually we find uh, a better identification, again, when you ask young people directly than if we wait for them to show up in systems processes. Um, but also it asks about risk factors related to their family or concerns or mental health um, or um, early signs of school disengagement. And using that information from these universal screening surveys, schools can then identify students that might need supports earlier so that we're not waiting until they're at a point of crisis. And because they have strong collaboration with community-based organizations, they can then connect those students and their families depending on the need uh, to resources that are available both within and outside of the school. And that involves this youth and family support system, which usually involves um, a degree of uh, coaching, case management, and advocacy on be behalf of the young person and, and their family are, um, so that they are getting access to the resources they need in disrupting those pathways, all the while using good data that's collected from the Universal Screening Survey every year through administrative data um, and through the qualitative human insights of young people and their families so that this model is constantly focusing on its improvements. And Equity underlies all of this, um, and we've seen other systems, for example, in juvenile justice, where we've seen significant reductions over the last 15, 20 years in the number of young people incarcerated, and yet there's a higher share of um, black and brown young people in juvenile detention now than there were 15, 20 years ago. So we can't just assume that we're going to achieve equity through prevention as a generic construct. We have to center equity. Uh, as a focus and a design intention um, in the work of prevention of student homelessness. So this is work that can be done. It's being piloted. Other school districts in partnership with uh, local funders and researchers could take this on and, and adapt and model this. And it's not too indifferent from uh, multi-tiered systems of support that schools are already implementing. Thank Next you. Slide. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and just to um, conclude, um, yeah, we, we, we need stronger policies and it needs to be an ecological model of support and um, really making sure that we're having a cross-system alignment uh, to provide these resources and we can actually have more of a one-to-one -one, um, connection to, uh, to different resources. 
using schools as a hub um, to actually be one of the places that actually um, centers this work. Um, having the prevention and early, uh, early intervention and also decriminalizing the process of supporting youth experience and homelessness. Uh, one of the biggest uh, issues that, that we face is that a lot of families feel like um, if they share their experience of homelessness, they may lose their kids as a result of um, being um, investigated um, through child protective services. Um, and so really making sure that folks know that there is opportunity for resources to be able to help without having to feel like they're gonna be criminalized um, if they actually share and disclose that information. So thank you um, for, for our section. All right, thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Um, so, so thinking about, gosh, bringing these worlds together uh, for students experiencing homelessness and funding, funding systems. So I'd like to go back to Dr. Jimenez Castellanos and Dr. Ferry to ask the question. So it was highlighted that Title I has become a catch-all for everything at the federal level, right? For, for young people who are, who are from, based on the federal definition, coming from, from low-income families. But for students experiencing homelessness, there's no direct money coming from the feds. There was one-time money um, as part of COVID relief dollars, 800 million, but that was rare. That was, that was one-time money. I guess my question for you is, if you were to apply some of what Matt and Earl have pushed us to think about, to a federal response to, to as we, we heard just now, well over a million students, probably much higher based on the, the survey that Matt led at Chapin Hall. Um, what, what, would that, what, what would an appropriate response be within this, this justice paradigm that, that you propose for us to think about today? Wow, that's a great question uh, and a very difficult one. Um, but you know, I, I I think if you if you think about just the transformative paradigm, right? Like, um, you know, I think we need to also. So I would say, let's just apply each of those um, components one by one, and 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 Matt and Earl can 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 fill in when when I may not have the expertise in their in their speci specific content area, but. Um, but I'm thinking that structurally we need to sort of tackle sort of what is the root cause of homelessness, right? And so if we only sort of address the symptom of homelessness, then it will be sort of um, a never ending cycle. Um, and, and it's sort of like the same issue with just Title I and poverty in general. Um, so if we don't really address Sort of the 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 structural issues, the 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 root of the problem. I think that becomes a, a fundamental, and I think it's worth investing in in those types of um, uh, of issues. Uh, secondly, um, if we think about an asset based distributive justice notion, right? So um, homelessness, you know, there's homelessness, and as as was stated, across the country, um, urban, rural. Um, uh, West Coast, East Coast, et cetera. Um, so, you know, instead of really, really thinking about sort of like uh, homelessness or the folks that are in that moment homeless um, um, from a deficit perspective, um, uh, you know, if we think about sort of how can we sort of fund programs that actually build upon sort of um, the strengths uh, and their aspirations as, as humans. And that gets into the dignity part, right? Like many times homelessness, we don't view uh, them, right? Um, as equals, um, uh, we, don't, we definitely don't view them as, with the same amount of dignity. Um, so I think we need to really shift sort of our mindset in terms of really sort of um, of seeing them as our neighbor, seeing them as our part of our, our community um, in much more meaningful ways. And lastly, um, you know, thinking about the procedure of justice, um, uh, how many times, and, and this goes to your notion about the process too, Joe, right? Like how many times are homelessness really uh, in an authentic way 
engaged in finding the actual solutions that would be most beneficial to them. Uh, many times it's imposed upon them um, based on what's more most convenient for government or for others. So those those would be sort of my my thoughts um, on the moment about sort of how to apply this framework, this transformative framework to to this topic. Thanks, Oscar. And if, if folks have questions, please don't be shy. I see Joey Harity is not shy. Thank you, Joey. He's putting questions in the chat box. Um, Danielle Earl, you look like you might want to say some. I'm trying to read body language over Zoom is hard. Yeah, no, no I, and I think um, just adding to to the fact that the issues that we're talking about are community oriented, um, and they need to be community oriented responses to it. Um, in order to best support students experiencing homelessness. Part of it is making sure uh, when we have programs, um, they're community-based, um, they're community responsive, and they're building back into the actual community. So one of the challenges that happens is that we have nonprofit organizations that come in from, from national perspectives into communities, um, receive a lot of funding, but that funding in the, in, the, in the human capital doesn't stay within the actual community. And so we uh, we constantly are having to continually bring in um, outsiders to actually address these issues. Uh, one thing I, I know is within my um, research as as a doctoral student was um, a lot of the students that were experiencing homelessness in the, in the studies I was doing were receiving support from um, local Black community based organizations that had nothing to do with um, with supporting students experiencing homelessness. However, they were part of the community and it was supporting the, the individuals and kids that they had in their community. And so part of the answer is also making sure that we're providing the actual foundation um, within these um, within these communities to be able to actually address some of these needs. And we're putting dollars into that community so there is more housing and more employment opportunities for folks um, within the actual spaces. Thanks, Earl. Um, all right, we're, we're seeing a lot of movement. I'm sure Danielle and Matt would would like to build on that question there's a lot to chew on there but um okay questions around the local control funding formula california's policy um uh strategy which is all 10 years um now now 10 years old um so there are there are policies in california around greater transparency even the governor's proposal um but i have not seen anything to date around changing funding for special populations um but it's a great question um janet um and then edith how are pushbacks and backlash dealt with in order to continue pushing for yes um so the, the kind of the political landscape um giving direct cash to students experiencing homelessness from carmen um so let's 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 go to the political landscape that creates barriers which matt talked about a little bit and oscar a little bit as well actually we all have um and then let's let's shift to this idea of direct cash who wants to take the direct cash question maybe which might be a little more straightforward i can take that one it's something i've been working on a fair amount so first i i just um i think it's a it's a really good question there's a lot of um movement there when we started work when i was at chapin hall on direct cash cash transfers for young people experiencing homelessness. Nobody else was really willing to push that. And then COVID happened, the murder of George Floyd, and there was increasing attention to um, the use of direct cash assistance um, as a model. This is not uh, new. Um, it's not without evidence. I'd say there have been over 165 um, impact evaluations of direct cash transfer programs in low and middle income countries showing very positive results for a range of outcomes. A lot of this um, then led to a conversation where youth with lived experience themselves elevated direct cash as, as a really useful, flexible instrument to help them exit homelessness, pursue their own aspirations, and pursue the type of housing that made sense for them. So they could also often come up with faster 
more creative solutions to their housing needs. For example, um, getting into an apartment share uh, with another young person or paying to stay a little bit more with a family member by helping out with the utilities um, or uh, being able to uh, find all, uh, all um, different types of arrangements or they might be able to pay for their housing uh, and then um, start investing in a car uh, or their education so that they've got long-term housing stability support. So they came up with a whole range of um, creative arrangements. We started this in New York City if you um, just Google Chapin Hall cash transfers for young youth experiencing homelessness, uh, something along those lines, you'll get a report that we put together with young people with lived experience that involved a co-design process. So it's not just another sort of basic income um, that's like $500 a month. Everything from the amount to the duration to the payment mechanisms that we use to the supportive services that were offered alongside of direct cash transfers were co-designed with young people who lived experience of homelessness uh, and using the best available evidence. So that report um, would document that. And, um, and now what we're seeing is a number of jurisdictions taking this on, which is, I think, really promising. Uh, I think what we want to make sure as jurisdictions are taking on direct cash transfers for young people uh, experiencing homelessness is that the design and, um, and the, the targeting of those resources uh, are um, in engaging young people with lived expertise so that we're making sure that the amount's not generic, but it's responsive to young people's outcomes and their aspirations. And that when young people say they face more than financial barriers uh, to success and thriving, that we're hearing that and we're making sure that that direct cash assistance is accompanied by the types of informal, local, community-driven supports and services that young people say they, they need as well. And Matt, thanks for your leadership in the space. Um, what do you think about cash transfer and trusting young people to, to know what, what they need and what's best for them? Um, and the research too, to back it up. So we have about two minutes, 30 seconds um, as these things go. So as we close out, I'm wondering if if you all could leave us starting with Danielle and then we'll, we'll go, go back through very quickly. Um, how, how do we tackle some of the broader political barriers we, we have in place? What's one thing we can do? What's that, what's that, that one thing? And I see this anonymous attendee um, saying that talking about housing and schools take being the catch-all for everything. That's why this book was written. And there's actually a housing chapter. And we've had a conversation this webinar around housing policies. We, we couldn't um, match all the chapters up so they fit perfectly, but I encourage you to listen to the podcast. Our children can't wait and, and, and buy the book if you can. So let's go to, let's go to Danielle, Oscar, and then Matt and Earl. Um, what's one thing we need to do differently as, as voters, as people, as listeners, take it away. Um, I guess I would as quickly as I can say that, you know, it's no accident that we have these like culture wars going on right now and the backlash against CRT and transgender students and all of this stuff. And I think we just got to be sure not to get distracted by that. Not that like those those, you know, those efforts are not uh, like harmful to people. They you know absolutely are. But like I think it should make us even more intentional around focusing on. The good, the good that public schools can do and making sure that the schools have the resources to address all of those factors and not shy away from conversations around multicultural curriculum and a multilinguistic, you know, um, appropriate material for students. Thanks, Danielle. Let's go to Oscar. Yeah, very quickly, I, you know, I, I, I think we need to sort of understand the context ourselves, right, and sort of say, you know, in this transformative justice paradigm, what piece of it can we tackle? So what I'm seeing in some legislative bills, a lot more asset-based language in bills in the last year or two than I have, you know, forever. Um, so I think, you know, you know, making sure that we, we stay vigilant, stay involved and stay active and, you know, trying to think about sort of what what component of it can can we influence? You know, whether it be the asset based framing or whether it be the procedural. How you know how can we as citizens get engaged in in sort of deciding um, how we fund our schools? Let's go to Matt and Earl. Uh, Insist and demand that student homelessness and educational equity are. Uh, 
seen and acted on as deeply uh, 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 interacting uh, issues and uh, move more upstream with prevention. Um, and, and last, I think it's really important that we recognize schools can't do it all. And however, we have, we as educators and those in schools have to see the interconnections um, between the agencies and advocate for agency policies to change in order to actually meet the needs of all our students. And so thinking about students experiencing homelessness, there needs to be more conversation between our educational policies and our housing policies and, and like agencies like HUD um, and HUD funding agencies that really meet the needs and also are talking about students and talking about youth from, their, from the perspective of, uh, of being students. Um, schools can't do it all, but we can see a lot of the issues and it's really important that we're acting on um, changing the policies that we can within the schools, but also advocating for the policies outside of school to actually change to meet the needs of our kids. Well put, Earl. Well put. Um, I just want to thank this esteemed panel for your time, your leadership, your scholarship. Come back, everybody. Mark these dates on your calendar, May 10th and June 14th. Uh, we're talking youth organizing and talking about the justice system on May 10th. And we're going to talk about how our history can inform our way forward on June 14th. So mark the date, sign up, register today, and um, please buy the book so you can read from these amazing folks and listen to the podcast. And um, just thank you all for spending an hour of your day with us. Thank you for your, um, your time, commitment, and uh, we will continue the conversation very soon. Thank you, everybody.